In this video, I want to explain the full ending of Modern Warfare 3's campaign, which, in my opinion, has felt very, very lackluster. It definitely feels like the main story beats and the main things that you need to know from this campaign could have just been explained in a few different post credit scenes of Modern Warfare 2 without it needing to be a full-on campaign. So I am going to be quite critical in this video, whilst at the same time explaining the relevant information you need to know, as well as what this means for the future, because basically, this game is just setting up yet another sequel probably Modern Warfare 4, which does suck because this campaign can really be enjoyed on its own. Other Call of Duty games in the past which have similarly set up sequels, the campaign's only purpose wasn't just to set up said sequel and could be enjoyed on its own, whereas I don't think you can get the same from Modern Warfare 3's campaign. So Modern Warfare 3's campaign's main purpose is to set up Makarov and build up his threat level and get us scared of him. Of course, the campaign starts off with Connie infiltrating the Gulag prison, Verdansk, and breaking him free. We then end up spending pretty much the majority of the campaign just diddling about trying to stop different chemical missiles that Makarov is planning to launch on Urzikstan. And all of this kind of feels very, very meaningless because in Modern Warfare 2's post-launch story, they had already established Makarov as a main threat. Of course, we had the post credit scene of Modern Warfare 2 where Laswell lets Captain Price know of a new threat. However, he is very aware of Makarov from previously. I don't really know why she wasn't. We then have the raids in Modern Warfare Warfare 2 that ends with Hadir dying, but before his final breath, he lets us know that quote unquote the real Russians are coming and they plan on invading Urzikstan, which are of course Makarov and Kony. Then we get a cutscene where Farah and Alex meet with Graves because Graves has intel on Makarov and Kony and lets them know that they plan on stealing deadly gas from Almazra to unleash on Urzikstan. So we then have the Warzone reveal event of Modern Warfare 3, where we work with Shadow Company to attempt to stop Kony from acquiring this gas. However, we end up failing as Kony infiltrated from within the inside Shadow Company to sneak out with the gas without entering harm's way. So that's where we were left, leading into Modern Warfare 3. We already had Makarov established as a threat, we already knew he was going to escape the Gulag prison, and we already knew that they had managed to acquire deadly gas that they plan to unleash on the world because Makarov wants to start a world war. That was already the building blocks we had before even jumping into Modern Warfare 3's campaign. So I I find it very obsolete that a big portion of Modern Warfare 3's campaign is just us trying to stop missiles and gas from going off once again. What was even the point of that? We already knew all of this stuff had already been established and it seems like the only reason why it was done again is because some people might have missed out on the post-launch story of Modern Warfare 2 and they needed to be caught up. And the Shadow Siege event and everything that happened on Almazra is just not mentioned at all in the campaign. Now the reason why it is such a big problem that Modern Warfare 3's campaign very much feels like just being filmed is because it is the third game now in this rebooted trilogy. Well, it's not going to be a trilogy. The Infinity Ward writers have came out and said that they plan on intending to make many different Modern Warfare sequels in the future, exploring many different characters. Of course, Modern Warfare 2, for example, introduced us to Valeria, who in the background of DMZ's story in Modern Warfare 2 was apparently helping Makarov actually acquire these deadly missiles and gas, which again doesn't really play any relevance to Modern Warfare 3's campaign since that's basically all just retold to us anyway. And we also were introduced to Alejandro Vargas for the Mexican Special Forces. So it really wouldn't surprise me if in the future they would do a spin off game just centered around the Mexican cartel going up against Alejandro Vargas. And I do wonder if it was planned for that to be incorporated in this campaign in some way, shape, or form early on in development. Because if you're unaware, the Urzikstan map was actually originally meant to be Las Almas. It's basically still the same map, but they've just reskinned it. If so, that means Las Almas was supposed to be in this campaign, and it was swapped out with Urzikstan, so I wonder what the story was originally going to be before they made that change, and why they made that change. Anyways, like I said, the big problem with Modern Warfare 3's campaign feeling like filler is because it is the third game, and you would expect by the third game for stuff to finally start hitting the fan, and craziness starts happening in the original Modern Warfare trilogy. Now, I know it was very over the top, and very chaotic, and very unrealistic, but major stuff was happening in both Modern Warfare 1 and 2, and come Modern Warfare 3, World War 3 was happening. So we were expecting a similar level of tension in this campaign, especially because Modern Warfare 2's campaign very much felt like filler as well. So if Modern Warfare 3's campaign was the second game in the franchise, that filler wouldn't have been that bad because Modern Warfare 2's campaign, like I said, the story very much felt like filler with no one really caring for the villain, Hassan, since he was 
basically just a generic Middle Eastern villain without too much depth. And he was just quickly and swiftly killed off at the end anyways via ghost sniping him. But I felt like we could kind of alleviate or not take too seriously that Modern Warfare 2 felt like filler. Because the missions were a lot of fun in Modern Warfare 2's campaign. And they had great variety. So where the narrative was lacking, it was made up for by the gameplay. But with Modern Warfare 3's campaign, it has very, very bland missions. All of the more linear style Call of Duty missions don't feel like anything new. It doesn't feel like anything we haven't explored in Call of Duty before. It's just done worse. And then a lot of the missions in the campaign are these new, quote unquote new, open combat missions, which are essentially just Spec Ops missions and they're very, very boring. And again, it's not really anything new because if you've played Spec Ops before, you know exactly what you are getting into. So I feel like Modern Warfare 3's campaign doesn't really have much of a compelling narrative. It's pretty bland storyline wise and boring even. And then the gameplay too is very bland, boring and mediocre at best. So when you have them both together, that's why it turns out so poor. Now with Modern Warfare 2's campaign, Graves was of course introduced, which is a great character. And we of course saw the Shepard betrayal play out as Graves and Shadow Company were ordered by Shepard. He gave the direction. And this was a very important thing introduced in that campaign. But that campaign felt overall very disjointed compared to Modern Warfare 2019's campaign. But like I said, this was made up by the fact that the campaign missions felt like they had great variety and were quite fun. And it was also made up by the fact that Task Force 1 for 1 were as a team first introduced in Modern Warfare 2 in this rebooted universe. And they were a fun family to see with great dialogue and great banter between them. So the dialogue and the character development in that game was very, very strong, I felt, but the overall narrative wasn't very strong. However, this strong part of Modern Warfare 2's campaign is missing from Modern Warfare 3's campaign. I feel like no character really, aside from Price and Makarov, stand out or have much role or dialogue even. I do think that the overall narrative of Modern Warfare 3's campaign is a bit stronger than Modern Warfare 2's, but the dialogue and stuff feels a lot weaker, which makes it less fun, and this campaign I felt like had very little character development, which makes it even less impactful. I really do think that almost every character had almost no role to play. Farah had quite a bit going on, but if we look at all of the other characters, Gaz, Soap, Ghost had a bit more than those two characters, but still not that much. We had Yuri as a bit of a side character as well, a bit of a paying homage to the original trilogy. And there was also Alex shown in the campaign, but overall, literally everyone I have just mentioned had such little character development or presence at all. They kind of just felt like background characters. It was nice that this campaign actually had a lot of characters in it though. And we got to see Alex and Farah back together. And we got to see a lot of the characters that were absent from Modern Warfare 2's campaign. That part was good, but because they were dealing with so many characters and the overall story as well was pretty bland and basic and just felt like filler, it felt like everyone was getting left out and people were just kind of appearing as background characters, like I said. Now, like I said before, the main purpose of Modern Warfare 3's campaign is to set up Makarov as this compelling villain. And we also, of course, saw the new version of No Russian in this game. So next game, whether it's Modern Warfare 4 or whatever they decide to call it, that should be the game where we expect all hell to break loose. But that, I really do think, should have been what happened in this game. Because like I said, Modern Warfare 2 had already established Makarov. We were expecting a world war to break out in this game. Whereas this campaign instead just felt like it was setting up Makarov all over once again, which was already done. And like I said, Modern Warfare 3's narrative isn't strong like Modern Warfare 2's, but it's made worse by the fact that it is the third game. Modern Warfare 2, we could excuse it as being a bit of a filler to set up Modern Warfare 3, but now we're here on Modern Warfare 3, we don't want it to just be setting up yet another sequel. It's starting to feel like this Modern Warfare rebooted universe is feeling very, very dragged out and they are milking the story for every last drop. And I don't really understand why they're doing this because there's so many characters in this rebooted universe where if they do decide to kill off a lot more characters, they still have a lot of other characters to work with for many sequels to come without having to drip feed and milk the story dry because they're killing any form of momentum. I think Modern Warfare 2019's campaign was a really strong story and that was weakened with Modern Warfare 2 but was made up with very good narrative and again Modern Warfare 3 is again a dragging story and the writers for Modern Warfare 2019's campaign did leave during Modern Warfare 2's development so I would assume that, that is why the campaign since have felt very disjointed and not on the same caliber as Modern Warfare 2019's. You know I know there's some people that think it's our fault for overhyping and getting too big expectations for Modern Warfare 3's campaign based on the original trilogy having a world war in this game. However I think this is mainly a fault of the manipulative marketing of Modern Warfare 3 because the campaign trailers were awesome and really seemed to imply that this game was going to be chaotic 
and a world war would break out. I mean, you literally get this quote in the trailer. We need men back now! He wants a world war. And then it pans to Big Ben. This kind of implied that Makarov would bomb Big Ben, and that would of course lead to probably a world war if it were to scale that large. But then nothing really ends up coming of that. We only end up going to London in the final mission of the campaign, and nothing really ends up coming of Makarov's plan in this mission. All that happens is we're trying to defuse bombs, Makarov pops up and just pops soap in the head, and that is the end of him. He dies. That is it. It just happens so suddenly, and it just feels so un earns. Now I know that this new reboot is trying to be more realistic and I guess this proves the point that anything can happen in war. Anyone can die in a split second, not even in war, just in life in general. So it's totally possible that something as anticlimactic as this would happen in real life. Of course not every single death has to be this cinematic masterpiece. So it doesn't need to be like Modern Warfare 3's original campaign where Soap died and we had this big monologue from Captain Price pleading for him. Come on, stay with me son. And so telling Price before his death that Makarov knows Yuri, this was a cinematic masterpiece and I'm not expecting Captain Price as well as Ghost to just pause what they're doing and just start emotionally bawling in this instance. No, they have a job to do, Price had to disarm the bomb, and as for Ghost, he did go down to check Soap's pulse and kept checking it, not really helping with Price, so you can clearly see how much it affects him. But then the problem is, after Soap is killed, Makarov just runs off into the tunnel, never to be seen from again. It's just such an odd way for them to conclude this story and it takes away from so much impact and so much of what they were building up with Makarov for him to just scatter off like a cockroach. And we literally don't hear anything about what happens next from here. And I'm worried that a lot of this is just going to be saved for the post-launch story, the seasonal cutscenes, when it should have been a part of the main campaign itself for it to feel like a complete package. I'll talk more about this ending of Makarov and Soap's death in a second, but first of all, I specifically want to talk about the new version of No Russian. I actually think this is really, really good, and it was a very scary mission. Now, I don't know if we can really even call it a mission because it really isn't. It's basically just a glorified cutscene. You can't really do anything within this mission itself apart from shoot a couple of Connie people. That is literally it. So, you know, it's basically just one big long cutscene, unlike Modern Warfare 2's original No Russian, which was very controversial, where you could actually choose to shoot civilians. However, I think aside from the fact that this is basically a long cutscene. I think the cutscene itself is really, really cool and is very scary. Having the Connie person talking to the ex-ULF member, which is the Urzikstan Liberation Force, and him pointing out all of the members of her family, naming them verbatim, would be such a scary thing to experience and endure. Of course, she then luckily manages to steal his pistol that was 3D printed. The problem with this cutscene is I do think they should have maybe shown a bit more of them actually putting together the pistol and stuff like that. I know it was the post credit scene of Modern Warfare 2's campaign, so it already showed sort of the build up to this mission. But if you missed that and you didn't see that, it wouldn't make as much sense. I'm sure everyone's seen it by now since it has been out for so long. So this is kind of just a basic nitpick. But yeah, I find this mission to be so horrifying when Makarov and Connie force her to then put on the suicide vest and throw it into the crowd on the plane. That feeling of helplessness that she probably felt during that would have been so intense, knowing that her fate is over and now the Urza and Liberation Force are going to be blamed for a supposed terrorist attack. She is going to be labelled everywhere around the world. All of her family friends will think she's a terrorist because she has been framed and she feels so helpless in that moment. She has to start fighting against the passengers who don't know what's going on just to try and get the phone to disarm the bomb and unfortunately the bomb goes off and that's that. I do think this mission is good but I do think that they should have designed it so that it is a bit more interactive. I don't know how they would have done that but it does 
does very much feel just like one big cutscene. And I have seen a lot of people hating on this new version of No Russian, but you have to understand this is a reboot, it's not going to be exactly the same as the original, and I understand your point that it is just one big cutscene, but the story aspects of it and the cinema aspects of it I think are really well done. And in general, all of Modern Warfare 3's cutscenes that look phenomenal, they're all beautiful and really well acted, so whilst there are a lot of criticisms to be had for this campaign, the Modern Warfare games always smash it out of the park in terms of the cinematics and the visuals. So yeah, this is Connie's plan, this is Makarov's plan to frame the ULF as attacking Russia, because this is a Russian plane, and even the ex-ULF fighter points out to Makarov, you would kill your own citizens just for this. And this shows how ruthless Makarov is, that he doesn't even care for civilians who live in his own country, that he is supposedly fighting for. Everyone to him is just a means to an end. Now, following on from this mission itself, I think it was covered up and framed way too easily by Connie, or Coney, however you want to pronounce them, and the aftermath didn't feel compelling, where it basically just showed news broadcasts of people suspecting the ULF to be terrorists, but it doesn't really show any country scaling and preparing for war, or even how serious these claims are. We don't know how much evidence the world knows that Coney were involved in framing this terrorist attack, we don't know. We just get these few little short news snippets. And yeah, I think the mission itself is building up to something crazy happening, but then when it actually plays out, it kind of falls flat on its face, and it's like, well, I guess World War 3 isn't really happening then, there's no actual real threat happening here. And it kind of makes the mission all feel for nothing, because no outcome ends up happening in terms of Coney's favour. Now, in terms of Modern Warfare 3's campaign, I think that it starts off really, really well. Like I said, it starts off with Makarov being broken out of the Gulag, and I really like how the second Captain Price finds out that Makarov has escaped from the prison, he immediately shifts operations. We get a cutscene which is similar to the AC-130 deployment in Warzone, and as soon as he finds out he escapes, he wants to completely turn around, not focus on whatever they were up to then, and immediately focus on Makarov. And that shows how, from their prior encounter, he already knows just how deadly Makarov is, for him to be top priority. And immediately, we are introduced to him. He gives a speech to Kony, and he seems so menacing and so threatening. The actor who plays Makarov is really, really well done. And he is very scary. He is different and toned back to the original Makarov. That was a lot more ruthless and chaotic. I do prefer the original Makarov, but at the same time, this new Makarov is different and does a really good job. So even though I am quite critical of the narrative and the story, this is no fault of the actor. He was just working with what he was given. And considering the fact that he doesn't die in Modern Warfare 3's campaign, I'm very excited to see what happens next in terms of his performance, if they are going to finally have a proper World War 3 next game. Which I'm not really sure how that would even work, because now the Black Ops and Modern Warfare storylines are connected. Black Ops 2 is canon in 2025, we're in 2023 now of course, so maybe that's why they can't do World War 3, because they can't have any major events that might coincide with stuff that happened in the Black Ops universe. If so, that'll be quite annoying. I am a fan of the connected universe, I just don't think it's being handled that well, and maybe it is too restrictive in terms of being able to do big world-changing things. And the problem is, if Makarov is not able to enact World War 3 in the next game, then what exactly is the next stage in his plan? Because he failed to do much in Modern Warfare 3. We spent the entire campaign chasing him, and then he never really managed to do anything to disrupt the world. So if he's not able to start World War 3 next game, whether that's because it can't disrupt Black Ops 2's canon, or there are other reasons, then what exactly is his next plan? Because he's been developed to be this calculated person, and if his calculations don't pan out, what else does he have planned? I don't really understand as to what the focus of the next game is going to be. We know it's going to be Price and Makarov going head to head, but is Makarov actually going to do anything to cause chaos in the world, or is it going to be another scenario like Modern Warfare 3, where he's very easy to actually stop, even though that's contradictory to how he was set up to be this calculated person. And next game as well, because his actor did such a phenomenal job, and he as a character is really entertaining to watch, I would like to see him actually manage to do some very damning things. But I worry that he's not going to have the opportunity to do so next game, and considering he didn't in this game, he needs to next game, and if he doesn't next game either, start World War 3 or something else that isn't quite on the same scale, but it's still pretty huge, then the fear factor and the threat level that surrounds Makarov will be reduced very quickly. But yeah, we get this big speech from Makarov, and then he immediately has Ivan killed for being disloyal and not trusting his plan. And this shows that to Makarov, loyalty is above all. I think pretty much the entire campaign up until the No Russian mission is really good, and it feels like it's setting up things really well, but then after that, everything kind of falls flat on its face. 
space. It feels like there's no proper middle and especially no proper end to Modern Warfare 3's campaign. It just basically feels like we have a beginning, Makarov, big bad guy, and then everything falls flat. And that's kind of it. And this is probably because the campaign, like rumours suggest, was meant to be DLC for Modern Warfare 2 and would have been an expansion. And I'm guessing if it was going to be sold as an expansion, it was originally intended to be shorter. And that could explain as to why we have these open combat missions, because maybe the only missions we were supposed to get in this campaign were supposed to be the more linear traditional style Call of Duty ones. But then when they decided to turn it into a full game, they realized it has to be longer, of course, to charge the full $70. And that's when they might have decided to add the open combat missions into the mix. So maybe all this campaign was going to be was this expansion introducing us to Makarov to lead into the true Modern Warfare 3, which I guess now is probably going to be Modern Warfare 4 instead. As like I said before, the writers have said they have many plans to do many different Modern Warfare games in the future. They are not stopping with a trilogy like the original. Now, despite it being made very clear to us right at the beginning of the campaign that Makarov needs loyalty, we see later on in the campaign that his financer, Melina Romanova, instantly caves to telling Task Force 141 intel on Makarov the mere second they threaten her money when they invade her private island. And I totally understand that money is the sole motivator for her. She has a very simplistic character and a lot of people in life are motivated just by money and she is no different. But the reason why I feel like this really has a little substance is because of how easy she caves. And also the fact that she was present in that mission at the start where Ivan is killed by Makarov for showing disloyalty. And he didn't even snitch on Makarov like she does. He just didn't think that his plan would work, which is way less big of a deal. Surely she would be a lot more scared to give this information over to Task Force 141. And she does look like she immediately regrets it afterwards and is scared for what will happen to her. But then we never see the aftermath of that. It really would have been nice to see a, a scene after that where Makarov has her killed or something and it's just very vicious and gory to really cement what Makarov will do to traitors. And I feel like that's a common theme in this campaign. We see stuff happen and then there's never really much consequences. And I think that a lot of the characters are very, very bland and carbon cutouts of themselves, lacking very little depth. <laughs> Regardless, I do think that this mission was very, very fun and I think was really one of the only fun open combat missions in the game and the island setting was awesome and I could totally see this being a resurgence warzone map even. Now, a big thing that's important in this campaign is Graves and Shepard are reintroduced into the story after we obviously learned that Shepard went into hiding following the events of Modern Warfare 2's campaign and Graves kind of took a back seat from Shadow Company and Oz became the de facto leader in the meantime. And in this game, Graves and Shepard managed to strike a deal with Task Force 141, despite them betraying them before. The reason they cooperate and give this deal is because they have information on Makarov. And at the end of the day, no matter what Captain Price and what all of the other characters think of what they did, they strike this deal for, I guess, the greater good and have to put their emotions aside, which I guess happens all of the time in war. So this is no different. And the reason why Shepard has so much information on Makarov is because he claims that he needs a win on his name and to clear his name and it's also needed for Shadow Company to help fix their reputation too after the incidents on which they of course fired in Task Force 141 and after that event their reputation was put into question with many viewing them as just trigger hungry business people in war zones and they were investigated by the FBI even we learn of this in the character bios of Graves and Oz in Modern Warfare 2 so basically it's two sets of people working together for different reasons despite the fact that they hate each other for a greater goal Captain, let me paint you the bigger picture. You need Makarov in a pine box, and I've got the nails. But the problem with this is that if you didn't see Modern Warfare 2's post-launch cutscenes where Graves is revealed to still be alive, as he apparently wasn't in the time can fake his death, you would have no idea what he's doing here, and it's not really explained in the game either. I think there was kind of a line needed somewhere where they kind of explain this, because I'm sure lots of people missed the post-launch story of Modern Warfare 2 and weren't filled in here. Now, the game does make a few jokes, such as this one from Graves. Without an army, you got nothing. Wrong again, boys. Unfucking believable. So, you missed me? Well, technically, you did, didn't you? And in the AC 130 mission, he makes jokes about the tanks. Enemy tanks destroyed. Good. Hate those fucking tanks. Three things you cannot outrun in this world, folks death, 
taxes, and me. So it is implied what happened, but not directly stated. And don't get me wrong, these lines from Graves are really funny, and Graves is a tremendous character with great charisma. So in that sense, I am glad he is still alive, even though it felt like it was kind of just done to sell bundles, and I would have rathered him not even faked his death in Modern Warfare 2 and just kept him alive. But despite these lines being funny, he's certainly not a good person, and he doesn't need to be to be entertaining or a good character to watch. But I think that a lot of fans on the line are being manipulated by his charm and not really understanding his character and the story Infinity Ward are trying to tell. I've seen many people defending Graves, saying he didn't do anything wrong, he was just following orders from Shepard, but this is never an excuse to do any wrong. And also Graves is shown the entire time to be trigger hungry and get enjoyment and excitement from war, which isn't something anyone should do, even if it's a necessity. And I think this is a common theme we've seen with other characters in media such as Patrick Bateman, where people get the wrong idea of their characters and then start fantasizing them and kind of misinterpreting their character entirely and completely not getting the point and end up falling for the tropes of which they're actually trying to tell the writers. Now the thing that I don't like about Graves making these jokes is I don't understand why he isn't called out by any other characters. Surely someone would be like, is this some kind of sick joke? You tried to kill us and now you're cracking jokes about it? However, he just says them, they're funny and us, the audience, of course, get a reaction from them and chuckle, but then no one actually in the game calls him out and is like, what the hell? And this exactly ties back to what I was saying earlier. I feel like all of the characters in Modern Warfare 3's campaign just really have very little depth. I don't really understand anyone's motivations and everyone feels so unpredictable because so many things contradict to one another. A character will do one thing, but then there's a line before that contradicts their actions. Together as one. Shepard only sees what he wants. His name on a win, not a medal on his chest. What do you see? It's what I don't see that worries me there's very little consistency with how people act. Now, in the penultimate mission of Modern Warfare 3, this is the AC-130 mission. And basically, the mission concludes with the possibility of us having killed Makarov. Good effect, hangers down. That's how we get her done, Shadow. Done, and Shepard slash Graves slash Shadow Company, like I said, want to win to fix their reputation, so they are very much happy to just declare Makarov dead at this point, because it'll be a win in their books and it'll put another star on Shepard's arm, because that's all he cares about apparently. That kill is not confirmed, I say again, that kill is not confirmed. We need to search the site for PID on Makarov. Gold Eagle Agro to all stations. Your orders are to stand down. We got nothing but fire and brimstone out there, and that's all the confirmation we need. Six, go to one. Go for six. It's over, John. We nailed that bastard to hell and gone. Yeah, that's what we said about your little shadow graves, yeah? Makarov's dead, Captain. Don't let him live inside your head. Eagle out. I really just don't understand why this whole debacle was even a thing. I understand it in that sense, but why on earth are we as an audience even led to question the possibility of Makarov potentially dying? Who in their right mind would have ever believed that? Why was that even a question? When this whole thing was ongoing whilst I was playing, I was just thinking, do the writers think we're dumb? Like, not a single soul would have fallen for this. Especially after they brought back Alex and Graves before, since they didn't die on screen, why would we believe Makarov is dead when we didn't physically see it? I just don't understand what the whole point is of this. Especially within mere seconds, the next mission starts and then we find out, oh wait, Makarov is still alive. Steam in hell. Is Makarov alive? There's comms from Azar 9-0. That's his call sign. What are they doing in London as well? It just felt like such a poor attempt at a bait and switch. And I understand the point of, you know, Shadow Company and Shepard and Graves wanting to, you know, just fake Makarov's death and pretend they've killed him because it's good for them. But they could have done that without pondering the question to Task Force 141 because obviously they wouldn't believe it. And I don't know why this was even a thing. I think it would have been more interesting if Shepard and Graves outright came out and said, we don't know if he's dead, but we're gonna do it because we need to. And then there's kind of some sort of argument that and choose between them and Task Force 141, furthering the tension that has already been building from their betrayal before. That would have been more interesting instead of them, you know, all basically pondering together and Captain Price being like, no, he's probably not dead and Farah then agreeing with him. Like, it just all felt so weird. I don't know what that was about. And speaking of Farah, I don't understand why she is so relaxed around Graves in this campaign and why she doesn't share the hatred with Price. Because Price lets Farah know about the incident of Shadow Company being ordered by Shepard 
Shepard to fire on his men. During the scene in which we learn that Shepard slash Shadow Company were supplying the ULF with missiles and gas, which explains how they were stolen in Modern Warfare 2's campaign, so that's a good little bit of information there and gives more context to Modern Warfare 2's campaign, but anyways, I just don't understand why she expresses such little concern when she is told this by Captain Price. She has a moral compass too, and it just feels so jarring, and again, the characters just have such little depth in this game, I don't know why. Commander Graves did this. Yeah, well, he had his orders, yeah. General Shepard. Did Shepard send you those missiles? My weapons are my business. And this does explain why Farah and Alex met with Graves for intel in the Modern Warfare 2 post launch, because at that point they didn't know that, that he had betrayed Task Force 141. But I still don't understand why when Price tells her she isn't angrier, and she's still completely happy to continue working with them for the greater good of Urzikstan, and there's no concern there that, you know, if these people aren't reliable, Graves and Shepard, then they could also sabotage Urzikstan in the future. They could also get them in trouble in the future because they're not reliable and will do whatever they need for their own causes, and I don't understand why she is so unfazed. And like I said before, a lot of the characters just do very little in this campaign, and we do see Alex and Farah together, which is nice because we didn't see them together in Modern Warfare 2's campaign, we saw them in the raids though, and Gaz didn't do much in the campaign either, or even so. And it was good to see, you know, a lot of the characters incorporated in this campaign, unlike Modern Warfare 2's, but at the same time, everyone just felt so underdeveloped and underused in this campaign. And I I definitely think that this makes Soap's death at the end of the campaign even less impactful because he had so little to play in this campaign. Like I said, I think Captain Price had a lot of presence, Makarov had a lot of presence, and even Graves and Shepard had, you know, a decent amount of presence. Everyone else were kind of just background characters, aside from Ghost. Ghost had more to say than the rest. But honestly, you could remove Gaz from this campaign, you could remove Alex or even Soap, just forget that he died in it, and I really think the campaign could have still played out just as it did. And Captain Price did give a very great performance in this campaign. Campaign. So regardless of the writing, I really think Barry Sloan just carries Captain Price's character. Now let's talk about the biggest thing and the biggest problem with this campaign itself, the ending. So like I said before, we end up in London defusing bombs and Makarov kills Soap just suddenly, which felt very, very weird. Makarov told Captain Price, never bury your enemies alive. Never bury your enemies alive. Which basically means to not imprison or capture your enemies because they can come back to haunt you because they're still alive. And also there's a flashback mission in Modern Warfare 3's campaign where Task Force 141 with Shepard apprehended Makarov as he was carrying out attacks on Verdansk's stadium and killing innocent civilians. Now, as it turns out, when we exfil with Makarov, he basically lets Task Force 141 know that he always planned to be captured. This was always his great plan. What's the rest of your plan? This. What do you mean, this? Amazing. You're all dumber than you look because it was basically a distraction so that he could get them away from the stadium and then it could be bombed after he was captured. So like I said, this was all part of his big plan. And when Makarov is captured by the task force, Soap says that, you know, he should kill him. Let me finish him. <laughs> John, we have him. He's in custody. He's not going anywhere. Stand down, Sergeant. And Makarov says he'll be seeing him again. I'll be seeing you again, McTavish. Which is, I guess, on the nose, considering, you know, four years later, or however long it was, he then ends up killing Soap. So yes, he does literally see him again and more. And even when Makarov starts carrying out these false flag attacks, Captain Price says, We had him in custody. I should have killed him when I had the chance. I should have killed him when I had the chance. What stopped you? So what does this mean for the ending of Modern Warfare 3's campaign? Well, Captain Price takes Makarov's advice. Clearly after Soap is killed, he takes it to heart, and he listens to him to never bury his enemies alive in the future, which means that Captain Price no longer will be taking any hostages, he will always be killing, because he regrets not killing Makarov when he had the chance, because if he did, he would have saved thousands and thousands of innocent civilians' lives, including the life of Soap, if Makarov didn't exist. Or at least hypothetically. This is the problem with this flawed logic. Yes, he could have killed him there, but we don't know what sort of trickle effects could have followed on from him killing Makarov there. Potentially, it could have even led to more deaths. We don't know the future. And that's why when this quote is even said, Soap says this. I shouldn't have stopped you. It was the right thing at the time, Captain. At the time. 
because yeah, it was the right decision at the time and you can't predict the future. You can't just go killing people, even people who are bad, to try and prevent things in the future that you don't even know are going to happen, because at that point you might as well just be as bad as them, going around killing everyone. You never really know the ripple effects that can happen from different actions. For example, if they killed Makarov then, maybe it would have inspired an even greater threat as someone could rise from the dust to try and avenge him, because that's Makarov's own logic. He kills people who he thinks are a means to their cause. I thought you were the good guys. So Captain Price takes Makarov's advice and Laswell, I don't really know why, but for some reason allows him access to get into Shepard's office and he hides in there and then he shoots Shepard in the head. And basically, this shows a turning point in Captain Price's character that he has quote-unquote joined the dark side as Makarov's actor has even tweeted to Captain Price on Twitter. This means in the future and the next Modern Warfare game, Captain Price is going to be ruthless. He won't be taking shit or bluffs from anyone. He will be just killing anyone he wants. And this has the potential to go very, very dark in the future. And I'm excited to see this side of Captain Price. This is definitely the most meaningful thing from Modern Warfare 3's campaign because this is really the only thing that moves the story forward. We have gotten rid of Shepard after his betrayal, and now it sets up the stage for Captain Price to be very, very dark next game. Just like Alex says, let's get evil. And I also find this quite poetic because Captain Price isn't aware in this moment that he's basically just becoming Shepard because Shepard literally says to him in Modern Warfare 2's campaign, to do good, you've got to do some bad. <laughs> You've lost your mind, General. <laughs> And this is the exact same logic as Makarov as well. Makarov feels like you have to do bad to do good, although his good is basically just Russia being this dominatory force that isn't a mockery of the world. But nevertheless, everyone's definition of good is different, and that's the problem with feeling like you have to do bad to do good, because everyone has a different definition of bad and good, and if you're going to do bad to meet an end goal, then you might as well just be on the opposite side of what you're fighting for. And this is the slippery slope that leads a lot of people to become bad or evil. At one point, Shepard would have probably been in the position of Captain Price and gradually over the years he started taking more and more leaps to doing bad and eventually his moral compass slipped away entirely and that's what we're starting to see happen with Captain Price. So I don't know what this means next game but I do think that it could mean that Captain Price will kill Makarov just like in the original trilogy considering the fact that he's going to now want revenge on Makarov after killing Soap and Captain Price could do some very evil things next game so I don't know what he's going to do and if he starts doing really bad things how is everyone around him going to react? How is Laswell going to react? How is Ghost and the other characters going to react? If he is going off the rails with no moral compass anymore, just guns blazing, are people going to be trying to hold him back and stop him? And if so, how is Price going to react? Is he then going to react poorly to the rest of Task Force 1 for 1? Is this going to cause a major disrupt in everyone's bond and trust? This is really something important to think about next game. And this was a big theme explored in Modern Warfare 2019's campaign. They were blurring the lines between good and evil. They were questioning what actually makes someone good and evil. Evil. They were saying, you know, one person's terrorist is another person's liberation fighter. And it really depends on who you ask and the angle you are looking at to determine where the line is drawn between good and bad. So I like how it's now come completely full circle to that theme of Modern Warfare 2019, where Captain Price, after experiencing tragedy after tragedy, is going completely mask off now. And if Captain Price does something very, very bad next game, I wonder if that could mean he could even be killed, because maybe he goes too far and it results in just getting him killed. And maybe he even and might deserve it if he goes too far. And of course, Gaz has been Captain Price's right-hand man. You know, he basically built him up throughout Modern Warfare 2019's campaign. So if Captain Price does start going off the rails, I think Gaz would be the first person to try and pull him back. But honestly, I do like darker storytelling. I am a big fan of darker stories. So if that's the route they're going with Captain Price, I think I'm really going to enjoy what they have planned next. And I guess the reason why Captain Price takes Makarov's advice and then decides to kill Shepard is because I guess he feels like if he doesn't kill Shepard now, Shepard could further betray them in the future or cause further chaos in the future due to his malicious and selfish ongoings and could cause further casualties in the future. So I guess that was his idea. He can't let Shepard continue to live like he did Makarov, otherwise more people, more innocent people are going to die. However, I just don't feel like this feels earned. No pun intended to Soap's death. And the reason why is that earlier in the campaign, we capture Shepard after he was surprisingly taken hostage by Makarov. We were trying to find Makarov and just randomly stumble along Shepard. Very weird, but apparently, you know, Shepard was trying to go after Makarov, but not very well, gets himself captured. Anyways, you know, Price and Co are very annoyed at that, and Captain Price essentially says, you need to give intel on Makarov, otherwise you will be dead. One wrong move, and I'll put a hole through.
and the thing is Shepard obliges and he gives them all the intel he has on Makarov and then that leads to the rest of the campaign and despite Shepard doing everything Captain Price asked, he still goes and kills him. And that's why this whole scene just doesn't really feel earned at all. Because what more could Shepard have done? Shepard hasn't shown any different side of his character to what he did before and why is it that only Makarov killing Soap is what sparked him to kill Shepard even though he said he would only kill him before if he doesn't do as he asked. Now this is a wild theory but earlier in the campaign Price almost dies when he's exposed to the chemical gas that Tony are trying to launch and then for some weird reason he just is suddenly better and there's no real consequences to him being exposed to this gas. You know you would expect that he's going to fall ill or be a bit more unhinged in the next mission because his psyche is not all together but then after that he seemed to heal and just be completely fine and then it's never really mentioned again in the campaign and it makes me feel like this whole scene was just a way for them to trick us with the marketing for the campaign because of course they showed the little snippet where it seemed to imply that Captain Price was injured and he might die. Bad people worried but then we play the campaign and there's not really any threat there. Captain Price didn't die, he never even came close to dying, he just randomly was exposed to gas and then was suddenly better. Very odd. There should have at least been you know a few missions where he was sick or wasn't even fit enough to go to combat. Now this is my wild theory. What if he actually was still damaged psychologically from the gas and maybe that kind of led to his sudden change in switch in motivations at the end where he goes and kills Shepard. Maybe that could be somewhat influenced by the gas. Now I personally don't believe this theory. It's only about 5% chance of this actually being the case but it's just a way for me to kind of justify the drastic change of character and it's also a way for me to kind of justify that campaign mission earlier where he just suddenly gets better after being exposed which felt kind of pointless and I'm just thinking maybe that is because it did actually play some importance. It just wasn't very obvious to us but yeah I know this is a very far-fetched theory so just ignore it if it feels too much for you. Now likewise as to why I feel like this doesn't feel earned that Shepard is killed by Captain Price is the fact that near the end of the game of course Graves as well as Shepard are testifying to Congress and both of them backstab each other. Shepard says he never gave the orders to fire on Task Force 1 for 1 and Graves says yes he did but he didn't follow through with those orders so they both lie and both stab each other in the back. Did you authorize Shadow Company to fire on a task force under your command in Las Amas, Mexico? No, I did not. Mr. Graves, were you given orders to use lethal force against TF-141? Yes, I was. Quiet, quiet in this chamber. Who gave you those orders? General Herschel Shepard. Did you act on those orders, Mr. Graves? No, absolutely not, sir. Quiet! Quiet! Shepard, of course, is only thinking about himself, and that's why he lies and doesn't tell the truth. In terms of Graves, yes, he also is only thinking about himself, but also he's thinking about Shadow Company. He needed to go through with this because Shadow Company's reputation was ruined, and if he didn't lie, it would be forever tarnished. There's no comeback. But it does show, of course, that Shepard and Graves, they never even trusted each other and would backstab each other the moment they deemed it necessary, which just further proves they are not trustworthy in the future. Now, one may argue, well, this is part of Captain Price's motivation to kill Shepard because he lies once again but how is this anything new? Shepard has consistently always been untrustworthy along with Graves. This hasn't shown anything new about their characters. They even remark as such after this hearing. Fuck me. I stabbed each other in the back. Still saving their own skins. Every man for himself. That's the difference between us and them. We're gonna let this stand boss. The best way to end the war it's to win it. No prisoners. And also, although Shepard does lie, he also does as he was asked by Task Force 1 for 1 when he was captured. Own up. Tell us everything. You know everything. Congress doesn't. And I bet they'd be. They'd be all ears, wouldn't they, eh? That's it? No. You clear my name. Tell them who I am, what you gave me, and why. No one else had the balls to do what I did for you. For all of you. Then do the right thing, General. All your intel on Makarov, your boy Greaves on a leash. Say yes. You get a warm ride home. He was told that he needs to clear Farah's name. He needs to tell the US that he has been working with the Yuzikstan Liberation Force and Farah and that they are not a terrorist organization. And he does so in the congressional hearing. 
We owe a debt of gratitude to our task force and to the ULF for our success against Vladimir Makarov and his private army. Much has been said about the ULF. Are Farah Karim and her soldiers a terror organization? No, Farah Karim is and always has been an ally to the United States and our Western partners in the region. How did uh, Commander Karim obtain American armament? For nearly a decade, I sent weapons to Commander Karim to support her missions against Al-Qatala and Russian incursions into Urzikstan. Were those shipments legal? No. In order to save lives, I commissioned illegal shipments with funds I approved myself. Quiet, quiet, please. So this implies that Makarov's plan to frame the ULF is all pointless because their name gets cleared at the end. So why, after Shepard doing them a favor, does he then get killed? I understand he lied in this scene, but at the same time, he also did them a favor, so it's just a bit weird why he just gets killed like this. It's a very unhinged thing for Captain Price to do, which is why I was saying maybe the gas was affecting his brain, or maybe he was just so traumatized by Soap's death that this caused that. But, you know, he's been in war for a very long time and I'm sure he's seen many friends die before. So I'm not sure what would be so different about Soap, and they haven't even been together that long, it seems. And overall, that's why I feel like this scene feels so unearned, but what does this mean for the future in terms of Graves? Well, I guess Shadow Company are safe now, and they're probably going to continue to work with Task Force 1 for 1 together, even though I don't think they're going to ever have, you know, a cordial relationship, but they're going to have to put their differences aside for the greater good, just like in Modern Warfare 3's campaign. But I could definitely see some tension rising now that Captain Price has had a wire snap in his brain, and he's is going to be a lot darker, I could definitely see him being a lot rougher and tougher on Graves, and something could spark there, where, you know, maybe Captain Price kills Graves even, something wild like that. I could definitely see some sort of bigger tension building between Shadow Company and Task Force 1 for 1 as a result of Price being more unhinged now. And also, what is going to be the consequence of Captain Price killing Shepard? Is Price going to be found responsible for him doing this? Who are they going to suspect? Surely there are cameras all over this place, surely he would get found out, and surely Lazarus well would get in trouble as well for allowing him access. Unless she's just going to erase all of the cameras and stuff like that, but there will be a lengthy investigation following these events, and in what world would Captain Price not be discovered? I feel like he's not going to be found out, but it just seems so unrealistic, and it seems very unrealistic that he would do this without the fear of being found out as well. And also, considering the fact that Graves and Shepard testified in Congress, there was going to be a consequence to this, since both of them backstabbed each other, Graves had the upper hand, he saved Shadow Company's reputation by throwing Shepard under the bus, so Shepard would have eventually been facing legal consequences. So there were already consequences for Shepard coming up, he already was found to be lying to Congress, and yet Captain Price ruins any potential justice and just kills him, when justice could have come from the legal system, which I know isn't reliable, and, and higher ups in the military get let off all of the time, so that very well could have happened to Shepard, but at the same time there would have been some kind of investigation following this and they would have been trying to figure out who is lying, Graves or Shepard. And now that Shepard is gone, they're immediately going to side with Graves, I guess probably. And also it seems dodgy on Graves' part and Shadow Company's part that Shepard randomly dies afterwards. Surely the government would suspect that Shadow Company slash Graves were involved and might be responsible for his death so that Shepard is not able to contradict or go against anything that Graves was saying. So it all just seems a bit fishy and I don't know how it's going to play out from here. Now, whilst I enjoy the setup that this cutscene makes for the future of the story, it also feels very jarring and kind of unearned. Because after Soap dies, I feel like we needed a scene afterwards where we see the characters, and especially Captain Price, vowing to go after Makarov. And we should have had some sort of short scene talking about what Makarov is up to next, what his plan is, because that would set up the stage for the sequel. But after Soap dies, there's nothing. We don't hear of what Makarov is doing next. He literally just runs away and we don't even bother to run after him or go after him. Literally nothing happens and that's why this campaign just doesn't feel like it even has an ending. And I really do think that before we got this scene of Shepard, we should have had a scene prior where Captain Price was just losing it and vowing.
vowing revenge on Makarov to then see that there's a wire in his brain that has broken and then we get the post credit scene showing him kill Shepard because otherwise we just kind of see Soap abruptly die and then suddenly Captain Price's character has completely changed. I would have liked to see just a slight little snippet introduced to kind of lead into that cutscene because without it, it kind of feels quite jarring and again, I don't really know why Laswell even allowed him to do this and I don't know what that means for her morals in the future as well. And regardless of us getting a scene, you know, of Captain Price and the others vowing to go after Makarov and avenge Soap and get revenge on Makarov, we definitely needed to have something about what Makarov is up to next and it's just like I said earlier in the video, I'm really worried that the reason we didn't get something about what Makarov is up to next is because it's just been saved for the post-launch seasonal cutscenes on Modern Warfare 3 and that's where they'll set up the stage for what Makarov is up to next and it just feels like that story will start feeling very dragged out if that's what happens because it felt like that's what they were doing in Modern Warfare 2's post-launch. They were building up Makarov's plan with invading Urzikstan with the gas and the missiles. Then we got Modern Warfare 3's campaign and it was basically that same story retold all over again and then he just randomly coiled soap and ran away. And then if we have Modern Warfare 3's post-launch once again just talking about what is happening with Makarov next and you know Captain Price and the others going after him and that builds into the next game it's just going to feel like a repeat of what we've already had before and we don't need this long of an introduction to Makarov we've already had him in the original trilogy anyways so we can kind of get somewhat of a gist even though he's his own unique character now with different motivations it is just not necessary to get this much. In terms of Modern Warfare 3's campaign in general I really feel like more people should have died in this campaign and maybe that's what's going to happen in the next campaign which like I said, it just feels like the story is getting dragged out, but the reason why I think that more people should have died is because they needed to show the havoc that Makarov will cause, and Soap of course was the most predictable character to die since he died in the original. And that's the problem with these reboots, whilst Modern Warfare 2019 told an almost entirely unique story, the last two games have tread on old ground, but have just retold things in a much less impactful and much less emotional way. If we look at Soap's death in the original trilogy for example, it was such an awesome emotional moment, if we look at Soap's death in this campaign, it's done so much worse and it's just so jarring. Again, if we look at Shepard's betrayal, it came out of nowhere in the original trilogy, so when they did it again, it was so predictable that this was coming. And the problem is they should be trying to do twists on these original narratives instead of just trying to do them in a slightly different way, but in a much more predictable and less impactful way. I definitely think they should have tried to do spins on these stories. For example, Soap killing Makarov instead of the other way around, or Shepard's not betraying us this time. Or maybe he still does betray us, but he has different motivations to before. Maybe Graves could have been the one to actually get him to betray us instead of the other way around. Anyways, they're just some dumb ideas I've come up with quickly on the top of my head. I'm sure with some more pondering, I could think of some better ones, but I'm just saying that I don't want them to just do what they did before, but worse. Try and do something different in terms of the narrative and the main story beats. Now, this whole game, like I said before, it kind of just establishes Makarov, of course, escaping the Gulag, and we learn, of course, that Task Force 1 for 1 have past history with him. And then he plans these false flag attacks to frame the ULF, Urzikstan. False flag operations. He wants a war. East versus West. The title fight. But then we seem to stop these very easily. He randomly shows up and then kills Soap at the end and then the credits roll. It's all just so weird. Makarov was also shown to be so calculated at the beginning of the campaign as he was responsible for so much between Modern Warfare 2019 and Modern Warfare 2. He was kind of the person, you know, moving all of the chess pieces behind the scenes. He was doing all of this from within the Gulag, by the way, being imprisoned. He was commandeering things using a phone from within the Gulag and he planned the attacks on the Vedan Stadium. He planned his escape from prison and the aftermath in those four years in the prison. He then escapes and starts enacting this big master plan, but then nothing comes of it. And this makes us feel like, well, maybe Makarov isn't as calculated and isn't as smart as he was being made to, out to be at the beginning of this campaign. And that's the problem with them trying to drag out this story. With us being able to basically stop him so easily in this campaign, you know, we get information from Melina so easily, we stop the missiles so easily, all of this, nothing ends up actually coming of Makarov's plan in this campaign. It makes it feel like he, it, he doesn't have it as together as we once thought and it's all just to set up yet another sequel with no real ending or substance and like I said post launch they're probably going to have some cutscenes showing you know what, what Makarov's up to next and the next stage of his plan but what was the point? Already Modern Warfare 2's post launch established he was trying to start a world war this game established nothing new Makarov's motivations for starting a war in this campaign are also a lot more compelling than the original trilogy if you've read his character bio basically his parents were working within the Russian government but 
they were trying to do good and change things from within, and he watched as the Soviet Union fell, and he woke up one day to find his father's hanged body, and I guess that was the tipping point, and he thought his father and the Soviet Union were weak, and he wanted to be different, he wanted to be ruthless and do whatever means necessary for Russia to not be a laughing stock of the world, that's how he thought people viewed it. And so he began a lifelong obsession, he then ended up joining the Russian military, and then basically enacted an unsanctioned attack on Urzikstan when he was working on Barkov's forces and they were unsanctioned and basically after that Russia stripped him of all of his military honours and he joined the Kony group to then plan the attack on Verdansk and then of course like we see in the campaign Task Force 141 managed to stop him. Well they don't really stop him, he intended to be captured to even start this attack and this was all just to get Russia's attention and then he was of course put in the gulag after that. But yeah overall his motivation just seems a lot less compelling because basically he just has daddy issues and he just seems like he's a whining crybaby, just desperate for attention in this campaign compared to the original, which the original Makarov just felt a lot more unhinged and his motivations were a lot different. He basically just hated the West and he wanted to see the fall of the West and a big war between East and West and send the world into utter chaos, which I think is different from Makarov's motivations, although there are some similar parallels. Now finally, let's talk about Soap's death itself. Like I said, it's very jarring where he just suddenly dies, but I understand, you know, Captain Price isn't just going to suddenly, you know, not defuse the bomb and just be emotional in that moment. They need to focus on the situation at hand. That's fair. Then after that, we get a cutscene where Captain Price, Gaz, and also Ghost, and they have his ashes in an urn, and they're on a cliff face, and, you know, they let them go, and, you know, they're saying that he's the greatest man ever, or whatever, you know. I personally just don't really like this scene. It just feels quite forced and unnatural, and it kind of feels like a way for them to just be like, look, we did something to honor his death. Personally, it just doesn't feel very realistic. Even the way they talk about Soap just doesn't really feel very human to me. It feels like it was forced, and I really feel like Soap's death was not even planned in this campaign. It, it really feels like a last minute decision. They needed a death in this campaign because they had gone the prior two games with not having deaths and constantly bringing back characters, so they needed to kill someone. They went the safest route with killing Soap again, but it was just done so suddenly, and then they needed this scene for some sort of closure for it. Personally, I didn't really like this scene, but I know some people may be different. It was, of course, better than nothing, but I guess you can't really, you know, praise them for that. But yeah, personally, it felt kind of weird and I guess what happened here is that his funeral or whatever had to be off the books and that's probably why there's only a few of them together. The funeral probably took place, you know, previously. And we also see at the end that Laswell has to basically cover up Soap's death because Task Force 1 for 1, you know, is an off the books task force. So basically no one can know about Soap. It seems like Soap doesn't really have any friends outside of Task Force 1 for 1 even. So that was basically his family and no one probably even really knows of him outside. So everything was kind of covered up by Laswell, which is definitely sad to see and they probably just had a very private funeral with just some members of the CIA and then I guess they let his ashes go later but yeah it did seem very very weird and it sucks that Laswell had to do that and again this whole incident just doesn't really feel like an ending when a character dies you don't just then suddenly end the game when your villain isn't even dealt with at all and there's not even any sort of build up to what he's going to do next it isn't an ending this isn't how you end a game this just feels like the setup this feels like what should have happened in the middle of the game and then after Soap dies they continue to go after Makarov and stop him or fail and then it builds to something bigger but just none of that happens. He just runs off and then what next? What is Makarov up to next? We don't know. It is such a bizarre choice for them to do it this way when, like I said before, even just adding in an extra scene or two would have helped this a lot. It definitely wouldn't have made the campaign good or fixed a lot of the other issues with the campaign feeling very lackluster and filler but adding just a couple scenes, one where they swear to go after Makarov after what he's done to Soap and want revenge and then another the scene, you know, talking about Makarov's plan and they've discovered intel and what he's doing next, you know, just adding in those two little scenes right at the end would have at least had some sort of proper ending. You know, it definitely wouldn't have made the campaign great, it wouldn't have made it not filler, but it would have at least felt like more of a proper ending and would have made the ending feel a lot less jarring. And we see on Laswell's screen, basically, Makarov's location is unknown, we don't know what he's up to next, and that's it. It ends. So overall, that's my general thoughts on Modern Warfare 3's campaign and what the ending means. I know this has been a very long video, so I hope you have enjoyed it. Like I said, I am really excited to see a dark side of Captain Price, but at the same time, I feel like everything building up to that felt very unearned, like I've expressed in this video as to why. I think it was necessary that Shepard died in this campaign because that's basically the main thing that moved the story forward. But really, the only two takeaways from this campaign are Makarov escapes the Gulag and he's probably planning something for the next game and he's very evil. That's basically it. And then, of course, the next big thing is Captain Price now has a darker side. He can Shepard. They're the two main takeaways from this campaign. Literally everything else doesn't
doesn't matter at all, and that's why it feels so lackluster, aside from the fact that the missions themselves feel very boring and lackluster, but the story just isn't well weaved together. Anyways, thank you for watching the video, make sure to subscribe if you're not here for latest and greatest Call of Duty news and information, so anyways, thank you for watching, and uh, bye.